Our speaker tonight is going to be Chuck Audie. Uh, Chuck is an avid bird watcher and also a co-worker of mine. He is the Gary County Extension Agent. So Chuck, I will have you, if you want to do a better introduction, I'll let you do it. All right, Ryan, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Just gonna, I'm getting to that age where multi-processing doesn't work. So get this screen up and then we're ready to go. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I really enjoy doing in-person meetings for the past year. That's been kind of hard to do. So Ryan, thank you for setting this up and I was more than happy to do this. Uh, just a couple things about me. I've been here in Geary County's extension agent for 39 years. Um, but more importantly, I have been bird watching since I was four years old. My mother was a bird watcher. My grandmother was a bird watcher. I was genetically predisposed. I never had a chance. It was bound to happen. So it, it really is not only my passion, but my wife as well. Um, I'm not really in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. As you see behind me, that's just so you don't see everything else that's behind me. But calling in tonight from the farm out near Milford, Kansas. So let's get going. When we were starting to set this up, Ryan said, well, is it too late in the season to do this? And I said, absolutely not. Actually, from the 1st of February until really well into May is some of the busiest times at our bird feeders. Um, and especially with the weather that's coming in, get your feeders stocked, get plenty of food in, in reserve because they're going to start hitting it hard during the next seven to 10 days. Even without snow, the cold weather is going to really bring them in. So let's just get going and start talking about birds in the backyard. Birds go where their needs are met. They're Look, just I'm like you and me. They, they Look, need. I'm going to cut you off for a second, and oh. I got a poll that I was going to open up with, and I. Oh, so that's I'm, right. I'm really bad about uh, doing all this, but I was got a few polls I was going to have them answer for us. So there you um, go. I, I stop sharing so you can do that. Oh well, all right. Uh, so I'll launch the polls. If you guys want to click on, um, I guess this is a true or false one, and once we get. A good majority of them to answer uh you know give them a minute or two we can go to the next question and uh we'll have one at the very end as well so and they're getting very quick at answering poll questions we've got 19 of the 26 so far or 24 of them, I guess, because me and Chuck can't, don't count on this. <laughs> Give them just a couple more seconds, get their votes in, and then we'll end the poll here. And I'll let Chuck talk about whether open water is important, or I guess we'll find out as we go through the meeting, but we'll end polling. And then so it looks like 90% of the people there, Chuck, said false. That, that is correct. Open Having water available, especially in days like we've got coming up, is very important, and I will talk more about that. All right. Then the next question we have is just another simple true or false question. Um, are feed mixes all created equally? We have a very astute crowd tonight. They maybe they ought to have been teaching us the class here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and since people are getting that done so quickly, we'll end this polling here um, real quickly, Ike, as well. And yeah, absolutely. Um, we put out different feeds for different birds, and that's going to be the the majority of what I'm talking about tonight is what's the best thing to use for the birds you're trying to attract. Question three is going to be a little more personal just to I just thought it might be interesting to see how many feet more feeders or how many feeders does everybody have. Um, I probably didn't go high enough for Chuck. Chuck's going to have to put his answer in the chat. So if you've got more than four feeders, uh, feel free to put your answer in the chat. And we can talk about that here in just a second. But. 
All righty. Well, we'll give them about five more here, five more seconds, and we will end this. But very interesting to see that almost 30% of the people had four feeders. So uh, yeah, that's that's a good even split, and that's that actually doesn't surprise me. That's about what I would expect to see. Awesome. And then the last question is going to be issues. And I, Chuck being our bird expert, I'm sure he gets all kinds of questions because of issues. But again, these are just very simple ones I could think of off the top of my head. If you have other issues, uh, you know, go ahead and put that in the chat and give us something to talk about at the very end of this meeting tonight. And just to let you know, as long as Ryan keeps this thing going tonight, I will stay on and answer questions for you. So, Cause I just, I love to answer people's questions. Right, so 84% of the people have voted. We'll go ahead and end that right now. And uh, it looks, you know, the wrong bird. So, and, and squirrels, I've, I get a lot of questions about squirrels, so uh I, I kind of expected that to be one of the top answers but uh we're gonna talk about all those things <laughs> perfect so now chuck i will turn it back over to you and let you uh go on with your presentation okay i don't know if you have to get that off there before i can nope we're good no you do have to get that out off of there or i can get it off there that works <laughs> okay <laughs> Well, that was fun. Brian and I were talking about this and he took some of those right out of the, uh, he'd seen my slides tonight and taken some of those questions right out of there. So, but they are a lot of the questions that I do get. Birds have the same needs that you and I have. They need food, they need water, they need shelter. Shelter from weather and predators, safe nesting and roosting locations, and just places to raise their young. It's the driving need for a lot of biological creatures. They want to, to procreate. So if we keep that in mind, it makes it easier to think like a bird and understand like a bird. Okay, and now it won't go forward. There we go. Um, okay, what I consider the order of attracting birds. Number one is cover. Do the birds feel safe? Um, if, if the picture on the left is your neighborhood, a yard like on the right may be a little bit much for some people to, to deal with. And, and the picture on the left was the neighborhood where I used to live in. The, the picture on the right is, was not my yard. It was a yard I was very jealous of. But cover is probably the number one thing that, that a lot of birds need. Um, water. Everybody feeds. Open water can be really be a problem, especially when we hold, head into cold weather or if we're talking about drought. Um, even in the middle of summer, sometimes if you're in a drought, birds need water and they're going to really start to concentrate where they can find it. And finally, the food is actually the number, the third thing on my list. And I say, give them what they want, where they want it. I love to cook. I love to watch cooking shows. You know, give them the kind of food and the presentation that they want. So crucial. There are many different types of feeders. And we're gonna talk about several of these. There's hanging feeders. It might be hanging off the eaves of your house, hanging from a shepherd's hook, hanging from a tree. Um, could be ground feeders. I've got a, a small four by four that's kind of hollowed out just like a little feed trough. I've got that on the ground. Oh, that's, that's one more. I forgot to count that one. There's actually eight feeders. Um, and I, quite often we look out in the evening and there's a couple of possums out there eating out of my, my trough so tube feeders are a lot of times those just those circular long things i should have had some here to show um, a lot of times we use things like thistle seed in them there's several different versions of that sack feeders are just a, a coarse gauzy type bag that you put small seeds in that they can get out of troughs i already mentioned they've even got trays that you can put on a deck railing or something so there's literally no end to the to the different kinds of feeders that are out there some are very decorative some are very basic I was doing this program for probably 20 years when it finally occurred to me that I really needed to break our feeds down into some basic essentials. And generally there are two types of seeds that we put out. Oil seeds and soot, I should say two types of feeds, not seeds, but oils and soot. Oil seeds are high in fat, often high in protein. They include sunflower, 
safflower, niger thistle, even peanuts. Grains, those are things like we grow here in Kansas. High carbohydrate, much lower protein. Millet, which is the little round, small, shiny white seed. Milo or sorghum, corn, wheat, oats. And birds have different preferences to those types of feeds. Um, oil seeds and soot should be in raised or hanging feeders. Grains should be in ground feeders. And I'll bet you a lot of you have said, well, I get this bird mix, I put it in my hanging feeder, and the birds just throw it out on the ground. They're throwing it out on the ground because they're getting rid of the grains and getting to the oil seeds, the black oil sunflower seeds. That's what they want. Now, there's other birds that will come and eat the stuff up off the ground. But, you know, I just say don't put grains in raised or hanging feeders. Put those down at ground level or low level. And I just talked about that. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, now, oil seeds are going to be consumed by almost everything. If oil, seeds wind, if oil seeds wind up on the ground, not a problem. Something's going to eat them, trust me. And we've got to throw some bird pictures in here because we are talking about bird feeding. Cardinals are probably the most loved bird, of the, especially the winter bird feeding season. Everybody loves cardinals. Cardinals want oil seeds. They want hanging feeders. They, they will come to the they, they'll go wherever the oil seeds are. A lot of times I'll see the cardinals in the evening down on the ground, picking up what maybe got thrown out from the, from the sunflower seed feeder. If you look at that beak, that big old chunky beak there, you know, that's designed to crack open seeds. And yes, cardinals come first thing in the morning, last thing at night. It's just the way they are. They aren't necessarily shy or, or easily put off. It's just what they do. They spend a lot of time during the day just kind of hanging out with others. And they do form loose winter feeding flocks. So if you're seeing 8, 10, 12 cardinals hanging together around your house, it's not at all uncommon. Okay, black oil sunflower, the number one seed for virtually all species. And that includes squirrels, raccoons, possums, deer, bears, everything likes black oil sunflower seeds. These are different than the striped sunflower seeds. The striped sunflower seeds are confectionary. Lower oil content, about the same protein. Black oil sunflower though is smaller. It's easier for even smaller birds to, to get a hold of and work with. Back in the 90s, the US Fish and Wildlife Service did a study and they, they hired people all across the country to put different kinds of feeds out and different kinds of feeders and then observe what birds went where to feed on them. Now, they never asked me to do this. I would have been happy to be paid to watch bird feeders, but they didn't ask me. So, But what they found was black oil sunflower seed was the number one seed that everybody wanted. Put it in raised or hanging feeders because that's, you know, the cardinals, the finches, the goldfinches, the siskins, that's what's really going to go there. Uh, blue jays, woodpeckers are also going to go after those. Oh, and let's have a tufted titmouse. Also, another one related to the, to the chickadee. Um, you get west of about Salina in Kansas, and you don't see a lot of titmice, but definitely from the Flint Hills and east, they're going to be common. You know, they got that black beady eye and that, you know, kind of grayish face. They're very nervous. They dash in, they grab a seed, and they dash right back out. But they want the oil seeds. They want those sunflower seeds. And I should say a lot of these bird pictures are not mine. I've got good friends that have cameras that are worth more than my cars are worth. Um, and they're very happy to, to loan me their, their, see, their, um, their photos to you. So, okay, white proso millet. This is a grain. Um, it, it's grown around the world. It's a second most preferred food of all species, amazingly. But it's primarily going to be consumed low in the strata. It's going to be on ground feeders, low raised feeders, juncos which are a type of sparrow, doves, all the sparrows. And by sparrows, I don't mean house sparrows. I mean things like Harris's sparrows and white-throated and white crown and fox and tree. Th those are what I say sparrows. That's what I, what I want to be talking about. But this is one, and I remember as a kid, seeing this stuff get thrown out because my mom and I were making the same mistake that a lot of people make. And I'd see it on the ground. I'd say, well, nothing ever eats that stuff. Then I got looking closer at it. What I found out is millet has this shiny seed coat around the edge and birds will just pop that off 
and then get to the to the carbohydrate on the inside of that. So what I was seeing on the ground wasn't the seed, it was just the shell of the seed that had been popped off. And here are our sparrows. Harris sparrow in the upper left, white crown sparrow in the upper right, fox sparrow in the lower right, and the juncos. Um, all four of these are winter visitors in most of Kansas. They'll be here. Well, juncos will start to leave in, in about April. Harris sparrow is about the 10th of May. Um, fox sparrows are a big sparrow and they're a striking sparrow to see, but these are all the kinds of sparrows that we want to see. They're going to stay on the ground. They're going to scratch around, give them something down low that they can feed on. Now, safflower is, 20 years ago, it was hard to find safflower. You almost had to special order it. Now you can go into Tractor Supply and Orschlands and usually find a five or 10 pound bag of safflower. It's an oil seed. Safflower oil is, is used in cooking. Um, it's somewhat less preferred than sunflower, but certain species prefer it. Cardinals and house and purple finches tend to prefer safflower over sunflower. Additionally, squirrels appear to be unattracted to safflower. I spend some time with a, with a trough feeder on my deck, and I would fill half of it with safflower, half of it with sunflower, and then watch what would come in. The squirrels would ignore the safflower, go straight to the sunflower. The, the cardinals would come in and they'd be picking up safflower. If they got a sunflower seed, they would literally spit it out and get a safflower. So treat it just like you would sunflower seed, put it in, in hanging or raised feeders. Here we have the house finch and the purple finch. House finch is up in the upper left, purple finch in the lower right. House finches are here year round. House finches were originally just a West Coast species basically west of the Sierra Nevadas in California, Oregon, and Washington. And then in the 1930s, unscrupulous um, pet dealers were trapping them, transferring them to New York City, and selling them as Hollywood linnets. Have a beautiful song. Well, the, the precursors of the Fish and Wildlife Service were going to go in and arrest them for illegally moving these birds around. The pet store owners got wind of it, and they let them go. That, along with growing population through the center part of the country, house finches started moving from the west east, from the east west. They met in Kansas in the 1980s. So really up until about 1990, they weren't that common. But now they're here year round, and they do have a pretty song. Purple finches are strictly a winter species. They're what we call one of the eruptive finches. Some years we have none of them. Other years we have a lot of them. This winter appears to be a good eruptive year. We've got a lot of pine siskins. We've got a lot of red-breasted nuthatches, and we've got purple finches. People get confused trying to identify to color. And I say, don't worry about the color. What I want to point out is on the house finch, they have a lot of striping here on the side, and it all tends to be brown. Purple finches have very diffuse striping, not a lot of it com in comparison. And it tends to be more of that, that purplish reddish color. They're going to want the oil seeds. They want a ground feeder or on a raised feeder. This is one species where the females are actually easier to tell apart. Here we have the female house finch, and down here we have the female purple finch. The purple finch has that real strong white eye line that the, uh, that the house finch just doesn't have. Fun to see any of them, though. Niger thistle, it's an oil seed. It is not related to the thistles that Ryan and I have had to cut out of pastures and like that. This is a, a, a seed from, from India, from Pakistan, from parts of, of Africa. Um, because of the day length, the seed will start to sprout and grow in Kansas, but it normally won't start to bloom until about two days before it freezes. So it won't produce seed here. It is expensive. The other thing about thistle seed is it has a very short shelf life if you if it's a 15th of may and you've still got some thistle seed you might as well just dump it all on the ground because it's going to go rancid over the winter i mean over the summer and the birds know it um, i've honestly just quit feeding thistle seed i just use sunflower chips and sunflower hearts um, it, it's just sometimes you can get a bad bag and they just will not eat it. Siskins and goldfinches love it. If you do feed it, use one of the tube feeders. It's got the very narrow little tiny slit openings because if they're bigger, the big circles, uh, the house finches will just go through this like there's no tomorrow. And it's just too expensive to do that. There's our goldfinch. 
Uh, this time of year, we do not have the bright yellow ones. That's a male in, in breeding plumage. They're just now starting to get it. And they go through, goldfinches go through two molts a year. They're starting into molting into their, their summer plumage, their breeding plumage. And you will see from now until the time they go all bright yellow, you'll see some splotchy ones out there. Here, the, the female um, looks a lot like the winter does in the, in the, the male does in the winter time. Very dull, very bland, trying to blend in, if you will, with all the dead vegetation. And that's why they do that. Another bird that wants um, oil seeds and hanging feeders. And right now, the, the siskins and the goldfinches are hitting my, my hanging feeders hard, real hard. And it's going to get even more so. There's a little pine siskin. And the thing about some people sometimes will say, well, is it a pine siskin? Or is it a female house finch? Two things to look for. Look for just a little hint of yellow along here. The, the pine siskin is also a very delicate little bird. It, it may even be just a little bit smaller than the goldfinch. And it has a very small and sharply pointed beak. The, the house finch has a big chunky beak that's kind of blunt at the end. So they're going to want the oil seeds. They're going to want the hanging feeders. Occasionally, pine siskins will stick around and will... Um, will breed here in Kansas. We've had them, I've seen juveniles in May at my feeders. Uh, most of the time though, they, they leave the state in the summertime, they go elsewhere. But this is a year when we've got a lot of them in the winter. Last year, I don't think I saw a pine siskin all winter long. So that's one that one year you'll have hundreds, another year you won't have any. Soot. Soot is nothing more than animal fat. The high quality soot is the fat around the kidneys of cows. Um, it sometimes can be hard to get a hold of. I, one time, um, my mom and I would get, she would get soot from the, from the butcher as a kid growing up and we would render it down ourselves, melt it down and get the stringy fibrous stuff out of it. I did that once after I got married and my wife came home from work that day and said, what is that smell? And I said, I was rendering down some soot. She said, that's nice. Don't ever do it again. So you can usually buy these for about a dollar a piece at Orschlund's at Tractor Supply. They come with, with the, the seeds already in them. Um, the original soot, once it started to warm up in May, you wanted to quit feeding it because you just had this, you know, kind of this greasy mess underneath the feeder by the end of the day. Nowadays, they've got year-round soot that has usually cornmeal or peanut butter in it, um, and it will survive. I feed soot all through the year. So woodpeckers, chickadees, nuthatches, brown creepers all go after this. And the colder that it gets, the more birds will come into it because the soot is a very good source of energy. It's going to be the, the fat keeps them warm. Um, the one drawback to soot is that starlings like it. And if you get a flock of starlings coming into your soot feeder, they will clean it out in about 30 minutes. So if that happens, the best thing you can do is just take it down. They do have some feeders so that the birds can only get to the soot from underneath. Starlings don't seem to be able to do that very well. So sometimes that can work. Um, but it, it really is. It's one of the feeders that I have out year round just because the woodpeckers love it. Here's a couple of woodpeckers. They are not to scale. Uh, red belly woodpecker on the right is a year round resident. Pretty good chunky bird comes in all the time. The bird on the left is a yellow bellied sapsucker. Uh, the yellow bellied sapsucker if you've ever seen marks like this on your tree, just a whole series of little about the size of a pencil eraser, that's what a sap sucker does. They make theirs, they're called sap wells, and they will actually eat the sap out of them. But the sap oozes out, insects come to feed on that, get stuck in it, and they will also eat the insects out of the sap. So they're kind of like baiting a trap. Um, if you see these on your tree in the, in the wintertime, because sap suckers come in in October and they leave in April. Um, the tree will usually heal these over pretty quickly in, in the spring. So don't worry about it. If you see it, there's nothing to worry about. Two other woodpeckers, the, the hairy woodpecker on the left, the Danny woodpecker on the right. The hairy woodpecker is about twice the size of the Danny woodpecker. And if you have both of them on a feeder at the same time, there's no trouble to tell the difference but they never do that. You've only got one of them. So I always say, don't worry about the size. Look at the beak. The Danny woodpecker just has this tiny little pencil lead beak. Harry woodpecker has what I call a real woodpecker beak. So that's the easy way that I say to tell them apart. 
And down in the eastern part of the state, you may also get the pileated woodpecker coming in. And that's the big woodpecker modeled. That's what Woody Woodpecker was modeled after. And these guys are the size of crows. They are so cool. Uh, a couple of other birds that like the soot, the white-breasted and the red-breasted nuthatch. White-breasted is on the lower left. They are here year round. They're a nesting species in Kansas. We've got them here every year. The red-breasted nuthatch in the upper right corner there has that little black and white eye line thing kind of going on. It's another one that some years we have a lot of them, some years we don't. They have occasionally bred in Kansas. This is another, again, this is a species that this winter we've got a lot of them coming in, but they're, they're probably about two thirds the size of the white-breasted nuthatch. These little guys go up and down the trees all the time, looking for insects behind the bark. They'll grab a sunflower seed, go out and stash it someplace. They're just absolute clowns and the red-breasted nuthatches are fearless. I have been filling feeders and hanging them up and had red-breasted nuthatches come in and land on the feeder while it was still on my hand. So really kind of a cool thing to have happen. Now the mixes. Mixes are made to be cheap, plain and simple. They put just enough of the good stuff in it, meaning sunflower seeds, safflower seeds, maybe some peanuts, and then make it cheap with the grains. If you're going to buy a mix, get one like this. This is a very high quality mix. It's got a lot of peanuts, it's got sunflowers, it's got safflower in it, um, doesn't have very much grain at all. I will buy a lower end mix to put in my trough in the ground because it's got a lot of millet in it and, and the sparrows that are down there feeding on it really like it. But most of the time I say just avoid the mixes, get straight white prozo millet to put in ground feeders, get black oil sunflower or safflower to put in your hanging feeders. But the as you start getting the, the better quality mixes, they're going to get more expensive and you're better off to just buy black oil sunflower seed. Here are our chickadees. We actually have two chickadee species in Kansas. We have the black cap chickadee in the upper left and the Carolina chickadee in the lower right. And you're saying, sure, Chuck, they look the same. Well, yeah, kind of. Their voices are a little bit different. The black cap chickadee has a lot more white feather edges in the wing feathers and the Carolina chickadee doesn't. The other thing is the Carolina chickadee is primarily gonna be in the counties that border Oklahoma. So as far north as we are, um, probably not going to have them. They are slowly moving their way north because they are much more tolerant of heat. And with global warming, we've been watching for the past 40 years, black capped chickadees kind of moved north. There's, a, there's an interface zone and it's slowly creeping further north. But most of what we're going to see almost all the time is going to be the black capped chickadee. Another bird that likes oil seeds, they want hanging feeders, soot. And they're fun because they'll dash in just like the, the tit mice, grab a, grab a seed, go off and feed on it someplace else where they feel safer. Okay, problems. Often have calls about no birds at bird feeders. And, and if you think about a year and a half ago, there was a, uh, a story that came out from uh, probably Audubon or American Bird Conservancy about how we have lost about 25% of the birds in this country, the breeding species in the past 50 years. Is that happening? Yeah, it really has happened. Um, so all of a sudden people were very aware of, oh, I don't have any birds at my feeders. What often happens, I mean, there's a lot of things that can cause that, but what, I mean, I get calls, especially October, November, even December. I don't have any birds at my feeders. Birds coming in in the winter time, especially the migrant birds like the juncos, the Harris, the sparrows, some of these, they're going to start off out in the country in weed patches, in crop fields, looking where there is um, natural food sources. We get an early snow, man, they're at the feeders. The snow melts, they're gone. As we move on into the winter now, bird activity is picking up at our feeders because the natural food sources are, are being eaten up. We get a little bit of snow, bam, they're right there at the feeders. Goes away, not quite as many. So that's going to be part of it. There's also other things. If you live in town, you may have hawks or cats in the neighborhood. Cats are, are I'll talk about both of those in a little bit. Um, you, you may have just somebody took down a tree across your back fence. That may have changed the whole dynamics around your, your backyard. Uh, the neighbors on either side maybe never fed birds before, and all of a sudden they are feeding birds. That can be another reason why 
all of a sudden there's not as many birds because there's more food available. So your, your feeders in your backyard or front yard are just one stop on a huge buffet line all around the neighborhood. So now that I'm out in the country, I don't see that so much, but I would definitely see that when I lived in town. Um, yeah, we already talked about that. Uh, if you have open water available, especially in cold weather like we're going to have coming up, that can be a big attractant too. can be a big attractant. Whether there's snow or no snow, that can be a big attractant. Cats. I love cats. Cats are amazing animals. We had Fred the cat in our household for 14 years. Tore us up when she ate when she died. Um, but, but they are not native to the North American ecosystem. Current research from numerous different studies show that cats kill over two and a half billion birds per year in the US and Canada. Um, there's no effective way to stop this other than to keep cats indoors. And that's where they should be. People say, well, put a collar and a bell on the cat. I have watched a cat with a bell on its collar stalk and kill a bird and that bell did not ring until it landed on the bird the very last second. I have been known to use squirt guns on cats and sometimes maybe even with a little ammonia water in them. I know people that have used paintball guns on cats. Um, if you can get people to just keep cats indoors, that's the best solution in the long run. Ah, uh, yes, that is a Cooper's Hawk dining on what once was a junco. Um, people get very upset when hawks come to their feeders. And I say, it's a bird, they're bird feeders, they're feeding. Um, you, it, it's just part of the process. Out in nature, everything is second place in the food chain to something bigger. Uh, so just realize it's gonna happen. Create a backyard habitat. I've got a whole nother talk on landscaping for wildlife, but make a habitat where there is a lot of cover. Lots of, uh, you know, I my Christmas tree at the end of the year goes out underneath my feeders. So there's something they can dive into. We've got a juniper tree, a cedar tree right outside where the feeders are. They can dash up into that. Give the birds shelter, give them safe travel lanes to come into the feeders and, and escape lanes when something comes. Birds have alarm calls. The alarm calls go across species. So if a cardinal gives an alarm call, the pine siskins, the finches, the juncos, they all react. And the alarm call appears to be specific to ground-based threats or aerial-based threats, to cats or to hawks. If it's a cat, everything just goes straight up. If it's a hawk, they dive into the deepest cover they can find. So just how you arrange uh, landscaping around your house can make it safer for the birds. Um, you know, do we need more cover? Do we need do, has the feed gone bad, which doesn't happen except for thistle seed. Sometimes I tell people, you just got to hang out by the feeders and think like a bird. A lot of times people don't realize how many things are happening inside their house that's creating noise outside the house, or even just a person walking between a light and a window is enough to startle them. So sometimes you just need to go outside, sit quietly, and listen and observe and see what they're doing. Of course, for some of us, it's easy to be a bird brain and think like a bird, not so easy for others, but not the birds you want. Uh, people say they don't like starlings, they don't like blue jays, they don't like house sparrows or grackles, blackbirds, or red winged blackbirds. Um, part of that can get back to what you're feeding and how you're feeding it. Um, but, but ultimately, at the end of the day, you put out a buffet and everyone is liable to stop by. In fact, it may have two legs, four legs. I mean, you never know what's going to be coming by there. Um, things like starlings, grackles. I tell people, avoid bird mixes that have a lot of the grains that we grow a lot of in Kansas. If it's got a lot of wheat, oats, corn, milo, go find something else. Look for millet, look for sunflower seeds. Now, I've always got to put up a picture of a Blue Jay because I've lived in Junction City for 39 years. My wife went to Junction City High School, and they are the Junction City Blue Jays. So I've always got to put it up there, and I like them. Blue Jays are related to crows, ravens, and magpies. Um, and these corvids, not covids, but corvids are considered the smartest of all birds. Incredible intelligence, incredible personalities. Yeah, they're loud, they're boisterous, but they can be really fun to watch sometimes. 
disease. Occasionally, we can have problems with diseases. Um, there was something going around here the past month about salmonella or something at bird feeders. I, I don't worry too much about salmonella. Um, conjunctivitis, if you ever see house finches at your feeders and the eyes are all crusted up, that's conjunctivitis, pink eye. Um, and, and if it gets a bad case, the bird's doomed. It's going to die because it'll go blind. If you start to see that, basically taking all your feeders for about a week, bleach them out, clean them up, put them in the sunshine to disinfect. Sunshine is a great disinfectant. Clean up all those spilled seeds and hulls because conjunctivitis is passed from the droppings of an infected bird to another bird that's scratching around in, in there that's mixed in with the seed. So sanitation is critical. You know, people say, well, how do you clean up all that stuff underneath the bird feeder? It's simple. Get out there with a shop vac on a dry day, and it's amazingly amazing how quick you can get that all cleaned up. I can see my neighbors in town going, George, Chuck's out vacuuming the ground again. Well, I was just sucking up all the, the seed and all that and then take it someplace and dumping it. So shop vacs are wonderful for that. That was the trough that I, that I would experiment with with the sunflower seeds and the safflower. But simply cleaning it, washing, in a, washing a feeder in a 3% bleach solution, um, then putting it out in the sunshine to dry for a couple days, great way to disinfect it. Squirrels. Oh, yeah. Um, squirrels will defeat any squirrel-proof feeder. There are squirrel preventive feeders, but, I mean, they will eventually learn. They love corn. Put out peace offerings. Stick a nail and cut off the head and stick an ear of corn on it periodically. The one thing that will work is to mix cayenne pepper, red pepper, uh, with the bird seed. Birds have different taste receptors in their mouths. They don't taste the capsation, which is what makes pepper hot. Squirrels, raccoons, possums, you can light them up. You can really light them up. So you just mix it in with the feed, mix it in enough so that you can plainly see it and put it out. I would have was having troubles one point in time, that trough that I had, possums were getting up into it. And the problem with possums, raccoons are destructive. I mean, they'll just tear a feeder apart. Possums defecate where they feed. So there's all these possum droppings in with the feed, which kind of discourages anything else from coming there and eating. So I was out and starting to, to lace the, the sunflower seed with red pepper every night. And one night, a little gust of wind carried it right up into my face. Boy, did that hurt. Now I understand why pepper spray works. Uh, it did work about three nights later. I heard a noise and there was a possum eating out of my bird, out, eating out of the bird bath. I went out to scare him away and he just turned and hissed at me. Uh, but he didn't come back for the rest of that winter. So cayenne pepper will work. You can buy pre-treated seed. It's pretty expensive. You can go to, to Walmart or Costco or someplace and get a big jar of red pepper, pretty cheap. Don't get chili powder that's not hot enough. It's got to be cayenne or red pepper. Possums I talked about, raccoons I talked about. Skunks usually feed not on the not on the seed itself, but on insects that are feeding on the spillage, which is another good reason to get things cleaned up. And rodents a lot of times are going to be down on the ground feeding on all sorts of things. We've got some kind of little cotton hispid rat or something living underneath the Christmas tree that comes out and feeds on there. He doesn't get in the house or anything, so I let him go. He's kind of cute. But um, that cayenne red pepper can do a lot. Of, it can solve a lot of problems. Water is going to attract things that won't eat seeds. Eastern bluebirds, cedar waxwings, American robins are not seed eaters. They will eat berries. They will eat crab apples. Um, but if you have open water, they will come to it. There's a time of year that cedar waxwings are really going to start to come in to our bird bath, and, and they're just an amazing little bird. And when you see a, a whole group of them just, just lined up around the, the edge of the bird feeder, it's just great. You can find these bird feeders a lot of places. I would say get the money for a little bit more, spend the money for a little bit more expensive one. Um, they're going to last a lot longer and they're going to work well. The, the, some people will use heated pet, pet waters. Uh, that's fine. Just find something to keep open water for the birds. And I started to say this earlier, but you put out a buffet, and I, and I feed year-round, you know, and you don't know what's going to come by. It might have two legs and wings. might have four legs, six legs, eight legs, no legs. 
if you're really adverse to seeing weird critters in your backyard, don't feed birds. Um, and, and just some final thoughts before we get to questions. You don't have to identify all the birds at your feeder. You don't have to identify any of the birds at your feeder. I don't care whether you call it a wild canary, if you call it a red bird, or whether you call it an American goldfinch or you call it a cardinal. If feeding the birds and watching them in your backyard brings you pleasure, that's what's important. They are amazing creatures. In the past year with the pandemic, uh, the number of people that have been feeding backyard birds and starting to go bird watching has just skyrocketed because it's something safe to do. It's multi-generational. It doesn't take a lot of equipment. The number of grandparents that have talked to me about spending a Saturday morning or a Saturday afternoon watching the birds at their feeder with their grandchildren and just loving it. It's just, it's, it's a no end to the joy that it brings all of us. Um, I'm readily available. Um, there's my email address. I'll leave this up for a few minutes. My phone number, this ksbirds.org website is, is the official website of the Kansas Ornithological Society. If you've ever wanted to know what birds do I have in my county? What birds do I have in, in, you know, around Franklin County? I've got 105 bird lists there of every county in Kansas. You can go there and find that. I also have a series of eight backyard birding guides, and I'm sorry that this is such a long web address here, and hopefully Ryan can get that out to you, or he'll put these slides up someplace and, and direct you to them. But I've got a whole series of backyard birding guides there that talks about wintertime bird feeding, some of the stuff I just talked about here, hummingbird feeding, get your hummingbird feeders up by April 15th. I'll just tell you that now. It'll be here before you know it. But just a lot of good information there. So um, with that, I'm going to leave that up for just another minute or so, Ryan, but we can sure start taking questions or get, you know, unmute your mics and ask and we'll go from there. And I'll get a drink of water. All right, well, uh, well, I'll ask you the first question. And if other people have questions, I encourage them to uh, unmute their mics or type in the chat. Um, one of the first questions, Chuck, I got was on some on an eagle. Do eagles keep other birds, or I think that's the question, do other uh, eagles keep other birds from coming to feeders or uh, maybe chase them off out of that location? Um, not really. Eagles are not bird feeders. Now, any bird is going to be nervous with a larger bird. We see blue jays mob crows. We see crows mob hawks and owls. I've seen crows mob eagles. Um, bald eagles are fish eaters, and they, well, I said they won't eat birds. They won't eat songbirds. They, they also live on, they also like to eat ducks and geese. So if you've got a bald eagle hanging out in your trees in your yard, count your blessings. It may make the other birds nervous, the songbirds nervous, but they're not a threat to them. They're not a threat to them. I had somebody once asked, they had a cutout of a wood of a bald eagle on their mailbox, which is about 100 feet from the house. They wondered if that was going to be a problem. No, it's not going to be a problem. So bald eagles really shouldn't be that much of a problem around household bird feeders. Thank you for that, Chuck. Uh, another question I had was, why are why do birds fly into our windows and almost like kill themselves, commit suicide? Uh, and what can we maybe do to keep that from happening? Bird collisions with glass are a real big problem. And if you've noticed, there's more and more architectural firms that are using all sorts of glass and they're working out. Basically, they don't realize, I mean, two things can happen. They'll fly into the side of the house if they get startled and don't pay attention. But with glass, they don't see the glass, they see a reflection of outdoors and they, and they think it, and the outdoors just continues is what boils down to. Um, the American Bird Conservancy is working on a lot of possible solutions. They're working on basically giant highlighters that, that, that we really don't see, but the birds do. You can try to put cutouts on the windows, but they have to be on the outside of the glass. If you put them on the inside of the glass, the reflection occurs before they see it, so they won't see that. But um, birds have amazing eyesight. They see into the ultraviolet and the infrared. So they can see things that we don't see. So they're really looking at some of these dyes or, or these highlighter type um, liquids that are virtually invisible to us, but they really just pop out to the birds. And I think we're gonna see a lot of 
solutions to that. Sometimes we just have to move feeders away, or I've even seen people put screening up uh, outside in front, just, just window screening or fine netting to basically intercept them like a safety net before they hit it. But it, it is a problem. Um, I think there's going to be some new solutions coming up. I've seen some people, uh, there's a process where you can get a, a very fine white painter, almost like a highlighter, and you put white lines, very thin white lines down the glass, about an inch or so apart. And it seems to work because the bird, if you go horizontal, the birds will try to fly between it, but up and down, they'll just ignore it. So um, I can try to direct you some of that, but there's a lot of new things coming out. I think in the next five years, we're gonna see a lot of, of new things coming along with that. So it, it is a problem and, and we're working on it. There was a question in the chat also, can, can we get COVID from birds or is that, I mean, has that been shown or proven? Any which one? No, no, there, there's been nothing shown. There's certain mammal species. Um, cats are one. Uh, obviously, the, the whole situation with bats. Bats, I'll just tell you right now, bats are a reservoir of amazing viruses that we're probably on the tip of the iceberg there. But birds don't seem to carry. Now, there's other things that birds can carry. West Nile virus, they're an intermediate host on that and things like that. But most of the time, I'm not going to worry about birds and, and COVID at all. All right. Um, I had one sent to me directly here. Uh, can I put oil seed and hanging feeders and suet in the same tree? Yep. Yep. Uh, I'll tell you in, in mine, I should get a picture of this sometime because a lot of times people say, well, you can't put this feeder next to that feeder. Doesn't matter. I've got three feeders about a foot apart. I've got a soot feeder. I've got a sunflower chip feeder and I forgot what the other one is right now. But um, I've also got a seed block feeder. I've got, I mean, they're all within about a six foot area. So don't worry. And how close can I put them to the house? Put them where they're easy to see. I mean, I've got stuff just right outside our living room window. Um, doesn't seem to bother them in the least. If you're not getting birds to go to a feeder, I mean, the question was really, how long does it take them to find a new feeder? You know, that just de depends on the time of the year. It depends on what you have for, for landscaping around. Um, I put out a new feeder the other day and it took about three hours and something found it. So if they're not coming, they should come to a new feeder fairly quickly. Um, it, it's just, it's look around at the rest of the bigger of, the, of your ecosystem in your backyard. If you're not having birds come to the feeders, start looking at, is there shelter? Are there a lot of cats around? Um, is there a hawk around? If you've ever noticed that, you know, lots of bird activity and then all of a sudden the birds are gone, except this one poor little goldfinch that's at the feeder and isn't moving. There's a bird of prey. There's a hawk somewhere nearby. Hawks hone in on motion. And as long as that goldfinch stays cool and doesn't move, it's safe. The minute it panics and moves, it's in trouble. So, but if it's day after day after day, start looking around and saying, okay, do I need more shelter, more cover? You know, am I making a lot of noises here that's, that's causing the birds to fly away? It can be a challenge sometimes, I'll admit it. And I guess to build off of that, the, the rest of the question, um, they put out a cloth uh, sack feeder of thistle and mm -hmm. nothing's been there yet. Is could that be because the thistle, like you mentioned earlier, is, is rancid and not any good? Yeah, take a look at most all bird seed packages nowadays have a, you know, packaged for whatever. And I've seen stores put out stuff that was two, three, four years old. I have had intermediate success with those sack feeders. Um, I've seen some people have really good, I think once the birds get used to it, it's fine. But you may just want to get a small bag, a couple pound bag of the sunflower chips and try that and see if that makes a difference. Uh, sometimes they just can't figure it out. Other times, once one figures it out, the rest of them go, oh, that's how it works, and away they go. Uh, this is a question I didn't really hear, um, or maybe you had answered it earlier, I guess, but it, it was about hummingbird feeders, and when should we be getting our hummingbird feeders out? I, I know we've put ours out in the past, and like last year, I didn't see very many hummingbirds come to our feeders, but when should I start putting them out? Okay, I'll give you the three minute short course on hummingbird feeders. Hummingbirds hit the southern end of the state about the 15th of April. I used to say mail off your taxes, put out your hummingbird feeders. Well, now we all do it electronically, so we don't worry about that. But 
and we're going to have this brief flurry of hummingbirds coming through in April and May. Um, by about the first or second week of June, the migrants are gone. And if you don't have any hummingbirds coming to your feeders, take them down until the last week of August, of last week of July, because about the last week of July, they start heading back south. The southbound migration is very casual. And August and the first couple of weeks of September is the peak time for migrating hummingbirds going south. Um, when they're going north in the spring, they've got one thing on their mind, sex. You know, they want to get up there and nest. So they're, they're going to fly on through. If you've got hummingbirds still coming to your feeders, second week of June, they're nesting somewhere in the neighborhood. Keep the feeders up and keep them filled. But so get them up the, the middle of April. If it's the first of June, you don't have any activity, take them down till the end of July and then leave them up well into the fall. Um, so if it rains, um, do, I, do I need to bring my bird feeders in? If I, or if I don't do that, do I need to dump it out immediately after the rains or how quickly should I clean those feeders out? In the, in the summertime, um, keep an eye on them. They can start to, if it stays really humid, um, they can start to mold in, in less than a week and then it gets caked up and it stinks. You just want to get it dumped out. Um, this time of year, fall, winter, spring, if they get wet, they normally freeze dry and it's not a problem. But um, in the summertime, yeah, I'll occasionally get, get uh, some seed caking up in a feeder. Okay. Uh, birds, we often see a lot of birds on telephone wires kind of lined up. Is there a reason why they would do that? Or Birds are, um, wintertime, birds will form flocks. There is safety in numbers, and that's absolutely the way it goes. Starlings, blackbirds, a lot of them. And they start grouping up. They start making those wintertime flocks late July and early August. They will start to get, a, get together early. Now, here in about another month, a lot of species are going to start to those those flocks are going to start to break apart and they're going to start looking for for mates or they're going to head back north. It's like we've got robins and blue jays in the state year round, but the robins that are here now are going to head north and they're going to nest in North Dakota and Canada. The blue jays that are here now are going to go north and the ones that will nest here are down in Texas right now. So once the once the, as the days lengthen, the hormones that make them go, ooh, I've got a nest, I've got to raise a family, really start to kick up. So about the first of March, things really start to happen. But yeah, they form huge flocks strictly for survival. Uh, somebody said they had a lot of Orioles last year, uh, last spring for the first time, and they ate a bunch of great jelly. Is yeah. there anything else that they eat? <laughs> they... Uh, Orioles will eat the same humming, same nectar that we put in hummingbird feeders. You can buy an Oriole feeder and it's a big orange ball. It doesn't have to be. I mean, I've got Orioles that go to my hummingbird feeder, hummingbirds that go to my Oriole feeder. Orioles have a sweet tooth. When they come in and the, they hit about the last week in April is when they, they arrive. A lot of there there's just thousands of them moving through the state, probably millions. If the weather changes and we get a cold north wind, migration just stops. So all of a sudden you may get three, four, five days of cool, drizzly weather, north winds, and you may have dozens of Orioles in your in your yard. As soon as it, you know, clear skies come, wind switches back to the south, a lot of them leave. So that's why we can sometimes have a lot, but oranges, orange halves, they love orange halves. They love grape jelly. I have a friend that just retired a couple of years ago, did a, did a study one spring, put every kind of jelly she could find at Walmart out in different dishes. They ignored everything except the grape jelly. Oh, they dabble at them, but you know, they pretty well ignore them. So grape jelly, and I don't know why, oranges, and then hummingbird nectar. Those are the three things that'll bring them in. Very interesting. I didn't know birds had sweet tooths. Oh, they do. Oh, they do. And the other thing is you'll get things like brown thrashers, catbirds, mockingbirds, that'll also come into that grape jelly. One of the uh, things I'd heard, and it's, it's not a question I'd had tonight, but uh, was people to fight like squirrels off, they've used uh, metal slinkies and like place those three-fourths of the way or halfway up a, a shepherd's hook 
right and, and has kept squirrels away is there any truth to this um uh, yes i mean something like that will work as long as there's nothing nearby that they can climb up and jump over that but they ha have amazing leaping abilities but yeah the slinky does seem to work it's quite entertaining to watch too <laughs> that's what i kind of envisioned i, I thought it was a, it would look like a cartoon yeah um, pretty close to it uh with that i'm running out of questions but what i would like i have one more poll that i would like to shoot up for everybody to answer if they uh would answer before i guess take before they hop off um i do see hang on we got when should you put your martin houses up put the martin just, houses up about the third week of march third week of March. all right i'm sorry about that i just it just popped up yeah it did so And if you guys uh, enjoyed Chuck tonight, would you please just put a thank you in the chat? Um, I did not pay Chuck at all for, for spending his uh, an hour with us now, I guess. And I really appreciate all the knowledge that, that he brought to the table tonight. It, it, Ryan, it's my pleasure to do this. My, my love of birds has no end. And I'll tell you folks right now, Ryan said, well, what if we just get two or three people? I said, I'll talk to two or three people. I don't care. I mean, that's the beauty of, of the virtual technology. I'm sitting at home in my, my comfortable desk chair here, and it's just, I just love to talk about birds. Yeah. Looks like we had 88% of the people vote, so we'll end that, and I'll, uh, it's just good information for us. Wanted to make sure uh, we were getting the information or what you got answering the questions on why you guys got on tonight. I wanted to help you out there. So um, with that, uh, if anybody has any last second questions. Ryan I, Ryan, I have a quick question. Okay, go ahead. I put in a water garden. I have the water garden and I expected to uh, get a lot of uh, birds in there. And I, I don't think I've ever seen a bird on it, but I put a... Uh, you know, one of the little round water things almost next to it. And I get birds in that all the time. Any explanation for that? Yeah. Um, it, it, water gardens themselves a lot of times are, are too big and massive or, or it's just a, not a good place for them to, they don't feel comfortable landing there. Um, running water of any kind is very attractive to, to birds. A, a dripper, a, a gurgler. Um, one of the neatest things I saw was in Cape May, New Jersey one time. One fall they just had a garden hose turned on lightly with a nozzle wired up in a tree so it was just you know just misting into the tree and there were birds everywhere. So running water is attractive to them and then sometimes smaller water is, they just feel safer going there. Sometimes water gardens and I had a water garden next to my bird bath for a while when I lived in town. Never saw anything in the water at the, where I had the small barrel but the bird bath was busy all the time yeah i did you know i put a waterfall in so i would get the you know the noise right and it just didn't seem to help them at all they so just like yeah said, sometimes the, they just the, they, 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 they want a good up. safe landing spot sometimes so and if it's not real obvious sometimes it just won't do it okay. the second thought is uh, i have bought you know the commercial suet and I can't hardly get a bird to eat it. And I found a recipe for suet and I can't keep it out there. I mean, they just eat me out of house and home. That's great. And that's, and that brings up that. a very good point. What works for somebody may not work for somebody else. So sometimes you just got to do a little experimenting around, see what works. I, I quote feeding thistle seed this winter, went to the sunflower chips, and at first, you know, for the first couple, three weeks, kind of like we were talking about this, Ryan, they just weren't hardly going through it. And now all of a sudden, I can't keep the silly thing full. So it just it just takes time and you've got to do a little experimenting around. Um, I, I swear there are sometimes regional differences uh, in what birds want, but just keep, you know, it's all about having fun. Experiment. You got nothing to lose except a few dollars in seeds. So just play around and try different things. And I've, I left my, I had my email address up there. If you have questions, email me. Don't hesitate. Call me if you want to. If you got a bird coming to your feeder, get a picture of it, email it to me. I can help you figure out what it is. 
Chuck, if we put a bird feeder next to a uh, milkweed garden, would we take, I mean, would we run any of those pollinators off or is that okay? That's a good question. I don't think you would primarily because a lot of the birds that are at the bird feeder are going to be primarily seed eaters. Um, and I don't think, you know, the birds that might be feeding on the pollinator species are probably going to be around anyway. So I don't think it, you're going to attract, I don't think it's going to cause a problem. Okay. But a good question. Well, the, my chat has been empty now. Um, I am going to encourage everybody one more time. If you have questions, ask the expert tonight and don't call the office tomorrow expecting Ryan to have the answer because I'm not the bird expert, Chuck is. So, but uh, not seeing anything else. So Chuck, I just wanna say one last time, thank you so much for getting on tonight. Um, we really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun, good questions. And you know, I'll just say right now, if you can tell me where the recording is so I can share with others later on, I would appreciate it and folks, like I said, it's going to get cold the next week or so. Birds are going to be hitting the feeders hard, hard and heavy. So have some fun watching and keep them filled. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell everybody right now, if we're going, uh, we're going to put this up on the Frontier Extension District website. Um, it'll be found under the Lawn and Garden tab. Uh, not exactly sure where exactly, but it'll be someplace there. Um, but I can get you a link to it as well, Chuck. So very good. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. And with that, I will say goodbye to everybody. Have a good evening.